Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Island College Basketball Podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, and leaky black Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, please smash the like button like your Brandon Davies. You have consent, and if you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, please knock that out while you're here. And while you're doing that, let me explain to you what it is we've got going on. It's called the Summer Shootaround. It's a series during which we're focusing on 20 notable teams over a span of 10 weeks, two per week, 20 teams in 10 weeks, and we're doing the schools in alphabetical order. We've already knocked out Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Auburn, Baylor, Creighton, Duke, Gonzaga, Houston, Indiana, Kansas, and Louisville. Now we turn our attention to the Michigan Wolverines. Went 19-15 and 15 last season, finished tied for seventh in the Big Ten, got an 11 seed in the NCAA tournament, beat Colorado State in the first round, beat Tennessee in the second round, then lost to Villanova in the Sweet 16. From that team, Michigan lost Four of the top five scores, but they do bring back leading score, Hunter Dickinson, plus rotation player Terrence Williams. That's two of the top six. Add Princeton transfer Jalen Llewellyn. Add Iverson Classic MVP Jet Howard. I like the core. I got Michigan ranked 19th in the top 25 and one. We'll see what Norlander thinks of the Wolverines next. But first, a word from our sponsor. The UEFA Champions League. Nine months of heart stopping, hold your breath, acceleration. While Mbappe shines in the city of lights, Benzema's racking up the hat tricks, and the Reds want Mo Magic in Liverpool. This ain't amateur hour. This is the best of the best of the best. This is the UEFA Champions League. Stream every match live on Paramount Plus. All right, Norlander. I got Michigan ranked 19th in the top 25 and one. That equates to second in the Big Ten. Most people. Hmm. Think I'm too high on the Wolverines. Am I too high on the Wolverines? Uh, when you say most people, does this mean you've tweeted out version 15.0 and you've got Sparty fans up in the mentions? Is that what this stems from? It means whether it's BartTorvik.com or our buddy John Rostein or anybody else who okay. ranks teams in the offseason. I don't think I don't I don't remember seeing anybody else have them where I have them. For instance, um, at Bart Torvik. They are. Let me guess, let me guess, let me guess. Let me guess. Okay. Oh, I think I heard a third. I'll say mm-hmm. 32. 36th. Okay. Rostin's got him 26th. And Jerry Palm's got him as an eight seed in his bracket, which equates to somewhere between 29th and 32nd. You're a little high. Now, Dickinson made a significant sophomore jump. I would even, I would argue that ever so slightly Dickinson might have been undervalued last season. Slightly, not not crazy. He was recognized as a very good player, and the Big Ten was loaded with a tons of talent and, like, just so many good teams and players in the Big Ten last season. So, you know, it's – it's it, and you had two first-team All-Americans there that weren't even expected to be the two best players in the league um, in Murray and, uh, and Johnny Davis there. Uh, but here was Dickinson's jump statistically, freshman to sophomore season. He went from 14.1 to 18.6 points per game. He jumped from 7.4 boards to 8.6. He was up to a block and a half a game. Went 0 for 4 from three-point range as a freshman. He took 64 attempts from three last season, made 21 of them. That's a 33% clip, which is solid. I would expect that to grow in his junior season. His offensive rating at Kempom bumped from 111 to 119.9. Uh, a very, If you're around 120 as a player, you're doing just fine. Um, so the question becomes, how much of a bigger jump will it be for him in year three? And then what the talent will be like around, you mentioned Terrence Williams back. Uh, well, Kobe Bufkin, who gets who was, you know, a bit player, will he uh, grow into something that's a bit more reliable from a role standpoint? Llewellyn was considered like top 20 level kind of transfer. Very good player out of Princeton and uh, wound up uh, picking Michigan over Clemson uh, in the 11th hour. So that's a that's a good get that Michigan needed a player of his stature because remember, Michigan lost. You mentioned four of the top five, but they lost, you know, they lost Musa Diabate leaving. Uh, and Caleb Houston leaving, I, I think if you would ask Juwan Howard in his heart of hearts at the end of the season, when they're, you know, the day after they get knocked out of the tournament, I think he would have guessed he would get one of those two back. He doesn't. They lose both of them. So here we are. Joey Baker is also here via Duke, which is also unexpected. Joey Baker actually initially announced and committed that he was going to spend his final year at Duke. Didn't go that way. We'll see what kind of role he has in this offense. I wouldn't expect him to be a top four option, but you never know. Um, Jet Howard is the guy to be excited about all, alongside Dickinson. Uh, we saw him in person a year ago. Uh, he was the kind of player where I saw him play like three games at at Peach Jam, or he was technically EYBL um, when I was when I was watching him. And to me, like the three games I saw him, and I was like, this guy is a top ten prospect in his class. And he was not rated as that. Like when I think when at that time he was in the fifties or maybe even the forties. 
but uh, there's a ton to like about Jet Howard's game. I, I think that he has got, uh, because of how much I think Michigan will need to use him and because of how much attention Dickinson's going to get, I think Jet Howard statistically has a chance to be, you know, at CBSSports.com, uh, David Cobb inherited the Frosh Watch from me, and he ranks the top 10 freshmen in the country on a weekly basis. Like, the chances that Jet Howard is in that Frosh Watch, middle of the season, then at the end of the season, I actually think are pretty good. Um, I, I, I really, really like his potential there. I wouldn't go as high to say top 20 for Michigan, but I certainly think they got to be in that top four in the big 10. And so with that, I put them somewhere in the 21 to 30 range. I think Co- coincidentally, David Cobb and I uh, touched on Michigan last week in a podcast because we were reacting to Jerry Palms first projected bracket for the 2023 NCAA tournament and one of the questions we were you know bouncing around was you know what team does he have too low and i i i I think cop said ohio state because he had ohio state as a 10 seed and i said i agree um but if i'm looking for a different one michigan um and then we started talking about michigan and one of the points i met made about jet howard is that you know he is ranked 42nd in the class of 2022 sub 40 prospect four-star guy but when I was doing sideline at the Iverson classic for CBS sports network, um, two things stood out. One, he was awesome. He was literally named MVP of the Iverson classic. And like case and Wallace played in this game. Keontae George played in this game. Case and Wallace going to Kentucky five-star guy. Keontae George going to Baylor five-star guy, both projected top 10 picks in the 2023 NBA draft. They were in this game and Jed Howard was the MVP for the winning team. The other thing that stood out is just randomly talking to the NBA people who were there. I worked with J.R. Smith on the broadcast. Uh, Steven Jackson was one of the coaches. Darius Miles was one of the coaches. Allen Iverson was there. And I don't want to say all of them said this, but this is certainly the consensus opinion among M- former NBA players there because they had come in, they put these kids through workouts. In JR's case, he had worked out with them a little bit. And the 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 thing I heard from multiple times from multiple guys was Jed Howard's the most NBA ready guy here. Now I don't think, I don't know, but I don't think J.R. Smith comes to that building with a great understanding of the 24-7 composite rankings. He doesn't know where Kaysen Wallace is ranked any more than he knows where Keontae George is ranked any more than he knows where Jed Howard is ranked. He's just looking at players. And he was like, the most NBA ready guy here is, is Juwan's kid. He's great. And then he went out and won MVP. And so I think he's going to be terrific in college, but I am aware that the recruiting analysts who have seen him way more than I and way more than J.R. Smith and Steven Jackson um, don't agree. And I've actually had conversations with some of those guys, the recruiting analyst off the record, just to see like, okay, what am I missing or what are you missing? And I've gotten some explanations for why he's lower in the rankings than where let's just say J.R. Smith thought he should be. Um, but from what I saw, big guard, he's six foot eight, big guard really knows how to play skilled the way you expect the coach's son to be. He looks like somebody who grew up in a gym and is fundamentally sound. And, and I, I, I'm with you. He is not ranked in his freshman class in a way that suggests he'll be a top 10 freshman in America, but I won't be surprised if he's a top 10 freshman in, in America on Jalen Llewellyn. Um, one of the points Cobb made last week was, you know, if you're relying on an Ivy league transfer, to help you be really good in the big 10, you know, are you, I'd be a little unsure about that. And I got a text over the weekend from an Ivy league coach. And he said, the thing you got to remember, listen to the pod. Yeah. Listen to the pod and just reached out just to make this point, which I appreciate it. Um, he said, the thing you got to remember about Llewellyn is he's not just an Ivy league player. He's a top 100 recruit coming out of high school. I, I didn't realize that. I don't think. I re- yeah, I remember that being a thing when he got when Princeton landed him. Yeah, he was top 100 in the class of 2018. Like I think ranked 99th according to 24/7 Sports. So 
this coach, an Ivy League coach who's been coaching against him for years, said he is a Big Ten level athlete. He's super skilled, and he's an established shooter. That's going to translate. He's going to be fine. And that reassured me a little bit about thinking Michigan's going to be fine. Because if you believe that Llewellyn's going to be great at the one, or really good at the one, that Jed Howard's going to be really good on the wing, and Hunter Dickinson's back in the middle, you're pretty good at the one three five. I mean, you're pretty strong there. And if you're pretty strong at the one three five, you got a chance to be a um a, a a really good good basketball team. You mentioned Kobe Bufkin. I I do think he's got to fill a bigger role. You know, he's a top fifty prospect in the class of two thousand twenty one, but only averaged three points per game last season. Only played ten minutes per game. So they need some guys to take you know jumps from their freshman to sophomore year. But I don't think they need any of these other guys to be stars. I think Hunter Dickinson can be your star. Jet Howard can be your star. These other guys just got to play bigger roles, play them well. And Michigan's got a shot to be really, really good. And for whatever it's worth, I don't know when we're running this question, but our Candy Coaches series is underway. And, you know, we're asking roughly 100 coaches a, a series of questions. One of them is obviously, who do you think is going to be the best player in the country this season? Hmm. And I did have a coach over the weekend text back to that question, Hunter Dickinson. Okay. Dickinson. Uh, yeah, that's going to run next. So people listening to this on uh, the week as we flip into September here, I believe that question runs next week. Um, I think Dickinson might've gotten two total votes. If you got one, I think uh, so, uh, but it can certainly happen. He would be, he would be there with, as far as I'm concerned, you know, someone like Trace Jackson Davis is like a dark horse um player of the year can not even that much of a dark horse but you know when you have timmy and shibuya out there they're going to be the the dominant favorites uh real quick on the roster thing Devonte jones came in from the sunbelt coastal carolina a year ago you know best player in that league uh he was good i would say he fell short of the hype not to say he was bad he was not a bad player he was fine but he shot 51 from two 40 34 points two percent from three 79 percent from the line solid solid distributor he was good i think llewellyn will be will be better than um than jones was schedule wise Regular season win total. We're doing it again. Here are the games to know. Uh, they're, they're, by the way, Michigan's going to play Eastern Michigan on November 11th, which is the day of the aircraft carrier game. Why am I bringing that up? Because Imani Bates plays for Eastern Michigan. That is a uh, That game has plenty of local intrigue, and Michigan was erroneously attached to the recruitment of Imani Bates when he went in the transfer portal. Um, I was told, I think I reported this on the podcast, but um, that was never actually a thing. Nevertheless, Michigan versus EMU um, in that first Friday of the season there. And I'm sure uh, Mr. Bates will have plenty of, uh, of motivation there. Here, the, the bigger games to know for Michigan in the non-con, they're going to play Pitt in the Legends Classic, and then they'll get either VCU or Arizona State. Uh, we'll see. I'm not convinced that any of those three teams are going to be dancing. Uh, Michigan didn't do itself any favors in terms of an MTE. Uh, then they get home versus Virginia, ACC Big Ten at the end of November. That's a good one. That's a really good one. Um, but, uh, real quick on that, this is how yeah. good. They, there's one team that got a vote in our candid coaches question. Um, which that team, already has run. That, yes. Yeah, that already has run. Uh, that that uh, who will be the best team in the country? There's one team that got a vote that is. There's only one that's not in my top 25 and one, and it was Virginia. A coach said, "I think Virginia is going to be the best team in the country this year," and then. Another ACC coach said he voted for somebody else. I don't remember who, but then just sort of in addition to his vote said, and I think Virginia is going to be really good too. And I, I said, oh, geez. I I, he said, I, I said, because I don't have Virginia in the top 25 and one. They're just on the wrong side of it. I had them in at one point this summer. Then they got jumped by people that added transfers or whatever. But this, this is an ACC coach. And he said, Virginia will finish first or second in the ACC. And that means – ahead of at least North Carolina or Duke, which are both going to be preseason like top five teams. Okay. I, 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 uh, I do buy that. I think there's, there's a chance that winds up being true. So home versus Virginia at the end of November, then Michigan will play against Kentucky and London on December 4th. Then a little more than two weeks later, the only other game of note in the non-con is uh, they'll play Carolina. It's a big one. They'll play Carolina um, in the Jumpman Invitational. That's that all Jordan brand event that's just starting this year it also features florida playing oklahoma that's gonna be in charlotte that'll be on december 21st so those are the non-con games i mean 
Pitt, the neither VCU in Arizona or Arizona State, Virginia, Kentucky, Carolina. It's good. It's it's not it's not terrible. Um, but there is no true road game in the mix there. Um, they'll play Purdue, Illinois, and Ohio State only once in the Big Ten GP. The home and homes against the notable teams are Michigan State, Indiana, Maryland. Fill in the rest. Uh, I have a tendency to pick first, so I'm going to sit back. I'll let you pick first. 31 regular season games. What's going to be Michigan's record this season? Okay, I'll go 13 and seven in the league, but I'm going to go 13 and seven while making it clear. I think that's good enough maybe for second place in the big 10. I think, I think the big 10 champion is going to have like 14 wins, 15 at most. I think it's going to be jumbled at the top. So I think 13, seven can still get you finished, you know, in second place tied for second, something like that. And then I'll go three non-league losses. So that's going to put me at 21 and 10. We are in agreement. I also have Michigan going 21 and 10. I would say 21. Now, I know you're speaking to the strength of the league. I get that. I would say if you've got a team preseason top 20 having 10 regular season losses, it's not unreasonable, right? Uh, you can't do this in the moment here, but I'd actually be curious to go back and look at your top 25 and one where it was, you know, the that Sunday of the final day or the Monday after the final regular season Sunday, right? So we're in, right before the big conference tournaments. What was the 19th? ranked team in that how many losses they have. I would I would venture to say that your 19th ranked team back on March 7th or whatever it was I would venture to say they probably didn't have more than eight or nine losses which isn't yeah, yeah I I don't know but like I'm just looking at it now Texas Texas had 10 losses on selection Sunday yep. and um it's all about the quality and got a, and got a six seed yeah you yeah, know exactly. um let me see here I'm looking at just te- LSU had LSU entered the SEC tournament with 10 losses and got a six seed. So you can you can enter your conference tournament with six loss with 10 losses and still be that's in that 20, five. That's 24th. Yeah. Yeah. You're in that, you're in that range. Yeah. Yeah. Fine. yeah Howard's won 65.6 percent of his games in three seasons. Uh 21 10 record is uh six seven seven win percentage. So kind of we've got him staying on uh on that trajectory. Last thing from me, uh Michigan just took an overseas trip. Paris and Greece, hell of a one too. Uh, for the, they met. They apparently ran into Adam Sandler at dinner on their first night in Paris, which is phenomenal. That's awesome. I'm sure some guys or some uh, people on the staff um, watched uh, that Adam Sandler uh, Netflix movie, which was which was really good. Um, so that must have been that must have been awesome. And then uh, you know they they went around Paris. If you're looking at when Anna brought up, they're all wearing. <laughs> This is I love this. this is, they're all wearing like matching shirts as if they were on some sort of, you know, family reunion. Just the, you know, I like the idea that like I kind of feel like Juwan Howard's going to keep that shirt and like proudly wear it around his house for the next 20 years. Really, really cool. Mm-hmm. They uh, they got to go to some of the biggest soccer stadiums. They went to the Louvre, went to Athens, sailed on the Aegean Sea, played three games there. The GP, just the whole thing looked awesome. It revved up. Uh, next year is my 10 year wedding anniversary and wife and I are officially uh like starting to consider where we should go. We're looking like maybe a three city, three spot jaunt over maybe nine days and uh, officially taking recommendations. But this, this really like going back and looking at what Michigan did, it sparked my wanderlust even more. So Paris and Greece is a hell of a one too. I think you were in Greece, dude, literally I, this summer, right? I was in Greece uh, last September. We went for last my wife. We went for my wife's birthday. Yeah. We went to Athens and we went to Santorini. Um, Santorini's like, the most beautiful place I've ever been. I, I can't, it takes a minute to get there, Yeah, but it's, um, it is amazing. I, I enjoy, if you're trying to pick what well, the interesting thing about being in Athens is like you sit down at dinner and you start talking to your server or whatever. And they, this question comes up every time. So when are you going to one of the islands? They, they're almost like you get out of Athens, go to one of the islands. Um, Athens was cool because of all the, you know, history there. Ruins. Yeah. Uh, but um, it, we didn't see Adam Sandler, but we did stay, um, they were doing a, the latest season of Jack Ryan starring John Krasinski. I remember this. Yeah, you brought this up. Yeah, yeah they were in the, the, the whole crew cast. Everybody was in our hotel. Like when we would go to breakfast at the hotel, like it was us and like the Jack Ryan crew and cast. But, uh, I never saw John Krasinski with my own eyes, but like everybody working on that series was was there. Um, been to Paris as well. Loved it. Loved Paris. Loved Barcelona. Yeah, that's on our list. I, I, we don't have, we don't know where we're going, but a few spots: Iceland, Barcelona, Porto. 
Ireland, Sweden, Paris. Like, we're not going to go all these places. We, we've got to figure out where exactly what we want to go to. Um, and uh, so, yeah, if you're listening, you've been to any places and you have high, high endorsements, find me on social media, tweet me, because we're going to try and decide the next, like, six weeks what we're doing next year. So um, so that's uh, Michigan. I got them preseason top 20, 10 losses on selection Sunday. I mean, uh, heading into the Big Ten tournament. But, uh, again, I just like that you know, the Ivy League coach made me more sure about Jalen Llewellyn. Yeah. Um, obviously, Hunter Dickinson's a proven commodity, and I think Jed Howard's going to be really good. Either either I'm going to look silly or the recruiting analysts are going to look silly because we are different on this guy. I have, From what I saw, he's terrific, and the NBA players who saw him thought he was terrific. And if you get a uh, Jalen Llewellyn operating at a – you know, translating really well to the Big Ten, plus Jed Howard being what – he looked like he could be at the Iverson Classic plus Hunter Dickinson just being what he's already been. I think you've got a team that can not only finish high in the Big Ten standings, but obviously compete uh, for a Big Ten title. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Huck Larnell. Thank you guys once again for listening to the Island College Basketball Podcast. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Five stars. Leave a nice review. There's more of us than there are of them. If you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel yet, knock that out. Thank you in advance. We'll talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.